Hey guys, I have a very exciting and very special announcement. Are you ready? Only in theaters. Memorial Day, May 25th, The Machine, the movie comes out. Only in theaters. The Machine, if you want information, go to themachine.movie. You can sign up to get updates. You can watch the trailer. Uh, they'll let you know when tickets go on sale or there any promotions that are happening with the movie. But how exciting. I mean, Bert told this story so long ago uh, on Rogan, and it's just become this amazing movie. So I hope you come watch it with us. We will definitely be there Memorial Day weekend, and I hope you will be too. So again, go to themachine.movie to sign up to get updates. Thank you so much for supporting. What an amazing journey. And oh, by the way, how crazy is this? May 25th was mine and Bert's first date 21 years ago. And May 25th is the date this movie is premiering. I can't believe that. That's so crazy. I think that's called kismet. I don't know. I don't even really know what that word means. But anyway, go to themachine.movie and sign up to get updates and come watch the machine movie with us in theaters. Thank you. Okay, this is a pretty big one. Five years, five years I've been doing Wife the Party. I can't even believe it's been five years. I can't believe it. Um, so my guest today is Halston, who has been my constant for five years. He's never missed an episode. So we wanted to talk about our favorite episodes, um, some favorite quotes, favorite book club, how uh, the podcast has changed Halston's life in some ways. Obviously, how it's changed mine, what I've learned about my kids. I think this was a really great conversation. It could have gone on for hours. Jennifer shut us down. She totally shut us down. But no, seriously, it, we could have gone on for hours. But um, I, I'm so proud of this podcast. I, um, you know, I was feeling when I started the podcast, I was feeling very lost and very uncreative. And Bert said, you should start a podcast. And I thought, why? Who wants to listen to me talk? And isn't that kind of gross? I'm like this comedian's wife who's now podcasting. And so I had to really... Um, calibrate and think about why I started doing Wife of the Party. And I think I, I think I'm still doing it for the same reason, which is I wanted to share my friends. I have amazing friends and I wanted to learn something in front of people so that other people could learn while I'm learning. And I have some really specific life experiences I think are helpful for other people. So this has been a gift for me to be able to sit with friends or with new friends uh, and just talk about everything from money to marriage to parenting to being a TV star to um, Girl Scouts to book clubs to, I mean, we've just talked to infertility to depression to mental health to addiction, sex. We've just talked about so many things and it really has been a gift to me. So Thank you, everybody who listens. My whole mission, like I said before, was for people to learn while I was learning. And the most fulfilling emails I get are those, are people saying, oh my God, I thought I was the only person who experienced that. Or I had no idea this existed. Thank you for telling me. And like I say in the podcast with Halston, if you compliment a guest of mine, I pass it on to them because they should know they're making positive change in the world. And we can all do our little part to make some positive change. Um, so thank you for coming back for five years. Thank you for those that just showed up. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for emailing me. You can still email me at birdieboyproductions.com under the wife of the party tab. Uh, I read every email. I don't get to respond to all of them, but I read all of them. So please reach out to me and please know if you compliment a guest, I send it to them because they should know. If you talk trash about a guest, I don't. So don't bother. <laughs> but anyway, I'm really grateful for Halston. I'm grateful for Bert for inspiring me to do this. I'm grateful for every guest that's ever come on to talk about anything. Um, and I'm grateful for you for showing up. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this five-year anniversary episode with Halston. Yay! Oh, Happy that? five years! 
Happy five years, Halston. What kind of ice cream is this? Jen got it. Is it vegan? No, probably not. It's got to be vegan. She wouldn't have gotten it on vegan. Birthday cake. (laughs) (laughs) She goes, oh. It's got 19 grams of protein per pint, though. It's healthy. Should we blow it out? It's healthy for you. (gasps) Yay! Yay! Years. I can't believe that, but I don't want this to melt. Will we you come back champagne. and get it? Let's do it. Do I have to drive anywhere? Well, we'll just do a glass. <laughs> do I have to drive yeah, anywhere? I'm not in a heavy drinking mode at the moment. You're not in a heavy drinking mode? No. That was you're, the holidays. Hey, you're not taking your own advice. You're not talking on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a producer right now. I'm a guest. <laughs> So here's how you do it, Halston. Okay. You pull the mic right up, uh, right next to your chin, as close as you can get it, mm. and then like, I- like this. No, not oh, like that. Not like that. As close as you can get it. Look, it's not a cork; it's plastic. I know. You know. It's gonna be loud. New and improved. You think so? I don't know. Well, don't do that. You'll hit my thing. You gotta put your hand on top of it so it doesn't. It's oh, plastic. Geez. It hurts. You have to twist it. It's yeah, a yeah, twisty, yeah. Probably. It's definitely a twisty. Uh oh, we're having trouble decorking. Uh, is it coming? Yep. Awesome. I've never seen a plastic cork on a bottle of bubbly. Neither have I. I feel like it kind of ruins it. Right? I wonder if it seals it better. Because cork is a natural. Pro- pro- hello! Cha ching! This bottle is massive. Like my, it's hands a magnum. Are, my hands are huge. But It's a magnum. <laughs> Who bought this? Jen. Jennifer, are you trying to get us drunk? My goodness, egregiousness with the producer of this podcast. <sighs> we'll start with a little bit. It's 10 a.m. 10 a.m. It's 10 a.m., but that's okay. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to five years. Cheers to five years. That's so crazy. Five years. What that's are we going to do for the next five years? We'll probably be in another three studios. You think so? I mean, we're about to be on our third studio. Don't tell me that because so. <laughs> this is not, oh, I'm so tired from this one. So we might have another three by the time we hit 10 years. Maybe. Ten years. I know, right? But five, though. Five is, it's Huge. insane. That's so sweet. Who got the balloons? Jen did. Aw, yeah. Jen. That was really very thoughtful. That's so cool. Yeah, I was like, we should throw a party. What do you think about that? getting some balloons and champagne and just like throwing a little party for ourselves totally it's a big deal yeah it's a monumental i'm like so proud of you i've been like going back on older episodes and just trying to decide what my favorites were and like what where i learned the most and like i was 26 when we started this wow (laughs) i was like a baby yeah so young and now i'm and i was like a year into my relationship. Yep. And now I'm getting married in two months. Crazy. And we've been together for six years now. So crazy. Yeah. We went through a pandemic. Yeah. Nuts. Totally nuts. The whole thing's been nuts. I, um, yeah, I did the same thing. I went uh, to our YouTube page and looked through all the topics we've talked about, all the things we've kind of addressed and all the people that have been here. It's been an amazing journey for me that you made possible because I can't do what you do. Um, And you've been a part of, you're the only consistent, right? Mm -hmm. In every single episode. So um, yeah, it's been a crazy five. I can't, I can't can't believe it's been five years. I can't believe either. Every week we put out a podcast for five straight years. Have we ever missed a week? I don't think so. I think we've deleted one, but we haven't. Yes, we did delete <laughs> we one. We haven't missed a week. You're right. We deleted one about divorce. Divorce. Remember that? It has such a great episode, too. Yeah. Which really stinks because, I mean, I'm happy that I'm ha- I was happy to delete it. I wasn't happy to delete, delete it. I was okay to delete it because, um, because of personal reasons for one of the guests. Yeah. Which is fine. Totally fine. But I was really bummed because it was such a great conversation. Did we delete? I don't think we deleted the audio. I think just the video. I think somebody was like, no oh, video. 
Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think the horse is still up there. I don't know. But like. what a great conversation it was. And I was so sad that. Yeah, really interesting. That we wouldn't get to share that information and those experiences with the world because so many people go through divorce. Yeah. I should probably do another one on divorce. That was so funny. One of the episodes was my literal next door neighbor, like in the same apartment building. Who was that? I don't remember. Um, oh, it was so long ago. She was my neighbor. She's a blonde lady. Oh, Felicia. Felicia. Yes. Yeah. She. I, That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. I used to always hear her talking to her dog. Lucky. Oh, yeah. Lucky. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Felicia. Oh, that man. There's like a lot of I remember the the man cave. So many memories there because we were four four years there. No, we've been here. We've lived Whoa. in this house for eighteen months. Whoa. So we've had to have been here for at least eighteen months. Okay, probably before that because this was up and running before we moved into the house. Yeah, June, I think. Okay, so June will be. Can you believe that June will be two years in here? So we're three years in the man cave, three and change. Three years. Okay, yeah, and then we're. Two and a lot of change by the time we get to June. Yeah. Here is so crazy. Wow. Yeah, a lot in the man cave. Um, the episode with the two women who are comics, I can't remember their name, uh, that did the massage. And we did a swap cast. We They came oh, yeah. and gave us a massage for their- Ricky and Charlie? Nope. Um, Ricky and Charlie are the two young ladies who live in Woodland Hills. Yeah. Who have the- uh, I can't believe I can't remember any of these names. What's the name of their podcast? Insert here. Yeah, insert here. Well, insert here. Picture. The name of Ricky and Charlie's podcast. I'm embarrassed that I can't remember it. I can't remember anything. I'm in menopause, okay? I can barely remember my middle name, which is Leanne, which is terrible. But um, the two women, was one of them's name Emily? Um, there were comics at the store. And they did a podcast where they gave comics massages. That was so long ago. And then they came on my podcast and she opened up about some trauma that yeah. she had. Oh, and, yeah. and that was the first time she'd ever talked about it. Mm. I was so blown away by that. One of my favorite episodes or one of the favorite arcs that we did was when we talked about sex with mm -hmm. uh, women. And then we talked about sex with men mm -hmm. and the juxta, the, the complete like, missing of communication like the missing not communication even the missing of like needs and wants and drive mm -hmm. was so blatantly clear in those two podcasts i thought that was really fascinating it, it, i mean one of the ways that this podcast changed my life is in that way with like your openness to talk about sex and just your relationship with bert like so many personal intimate details mm -hmm. that most people just don't share. Like, I'm not going to hear that from my auntie mm -hmm. or my mom mm -hmm. or like my grandma or anybody like that. My sister, nobody, all the closest women in my life. They're not going to talk like that, right. like that honest and open. And the fact that you're willing to do that and you do that yeah. is kind of like life changing for me in Aww. my relationship because I go, oh, this must be how Brooke is feeling or, oh, let me try this with Brooke or, oh, let me um, ask her if this is how she feels. Mm -hmm. And like, I wouldn't get that anywhere else, maybe other than maybe therapy, but it would probably take a long time to get there. You right. get straight to the point and I go, got it. Yeah, that's what must be going on. Right. It is interesting to put your life out there in that way. My intention has never to been to be like, hey, come come be like a voyeur on my fabulous life. But that's not that's not me. I think I always thought we are who we are because of our warts, you know? Yes. And you can't learn how to deal with your own warts sometimes if you don't step side outside of yourself. You have to see someone else's point of view or watch someone else's experience to be able to self-reflect. Self-reflecting is yeah. very hard. I just said this to my trainer yesterday. I was like, sometimes it's hard for me to remember that not everyone has my life experiences. I've had so many vastly different life experiences throughout my whole life. I'm, I'm not someone who, much like you, did grow up in one house on one street with two parents. I have so many different modalities of input yeah. for my person yeah. that... 
that all comes to the table when I'm in a relationship, when I am uh, approaching a project, when I'm managing anything, when I'm parenting. And it's sometimes hard to remember that not everybody has all of those inputs. They may have a much more limited input. Yeah. So if someone can listen to a conversation I'm having with someone else or with myself where they can get a different input, it's got to be enriching. It's got to be. It's huge. It absolutely is. I love that. That makes me so happy. And like sharing your friends on episode 18, I went back Mm -hmm. and I don't even, I don't actually remember what episode it was. It might have been sex part one, Mm -hmm. but, or maybe 20s, 30s, 40s. But, anyways, you started off by kind of reflecting on the 18 episodes and you're like, Oh my gosh, 18 episodes. I can't believe we've done it for this long. That's so cool. And like (laughs) you were talking about how you receive so many messages from fans and listeners just thanking you for sharing your friends Mm -hmm. because your friends are really cool. Yeah. And really open and honest, Mm -hmm. like much like you. And they've there's some that have been doing this podcast for five years straight. Yeah. Kathy and Kirsten. Yeah. And that's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. And they're like, they don't like, they're doing it because they love you and they like to hang out with you and like share this with you. I think it's one more thing. I think it is that. What else? But I think it is they, you know, when you're clear with your vision, people can get behind your vision. And I've always been very clear with my vision for this podcast. It is to learn Mm -hmm. in front of people, Yeah, to have honest, open conversations in front of people so that we can all learn at the same time. I've never needed to be right or to have the answers. I've always just needed to be curious. And I've always expressed that to anybody I've asked to be on this podcast. Mm -hmm. My position here is not to be a person of exposition. That's just to be showy for showy's sake. My mission is to expose yourself to learn, which is a very different intention. So Kathy and Kirsten in particular have a volunteer spirit. They have a greater good sensibility. They have that same value system I have. So when I say, hey, let's come have a conversation, they want to do it for all the things you said, which is true. They like to hang out with me and have a conversation. But I think they also enjoy knowing because when people email me and they talk about anybody who's on the podcast, I always forward it to that person. Yeah, that's so cool. I do. Because if you if you email me and say, hey, Jeffrey Renna, who was just on, really inspired me to do ABC. Jeffrey should know that. It's not for me. It's for the world. So if you're co- emailing me to compliment a guest, that guest always gets that compliment because yeah, but people don't do that. But why not? Because it's a it's a pain in the ass. No, it's not. Yeah, but it's not. You know why? People. It takes one second of my time to go forward. Jeffrey Renna send. That's all it takes. Yeah. It takes one second. And guess what I've done? I've made Jeffrey Renna's day. And yeah. that took one second of my time. And guess what that does? It makes me feel better about me yeah. because I've shared positivity. Yeah. I've shared Look what you're doing. Now, we may only reach, I don't even know how many people I reach. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Well, I may only reach that (laughs) number of people, but imagine if that number of people just had one moment of self-reflection and made a slight paradigm shift to the left and it changed their life. Why would you not do something like that? I don't know. None of that's a waste of time. Yeah, but you think about this thing. Some people would read that email and be so self-involved that they go look what i did and not think about the other person no you think about the other person and you go this is why i'm doing this podcast that's exactly right yeah as i go i feel like i'm a conduit for other people's information and my own i have a lot of, of, of i have a lot of information yeah and you're so good and clear at telling people that information i'm not that good at at that I like to listen to you because you can read something or learn something and spit it back out in a a clear, precise, 
way that not everyone can. And that, that's like well, your huge skill that you have. Well, that may be true. Yeah. I, I am good at analyzing material, <laughs> whether that be verbal or that be an experience. Mm-hmm. I think from growing up the way I did and and feeling in my gut that something that's happening is not right uh, and not having the maturity because I was a child to analyze that and then put it in a proper place and move forward. I think that was my goal as a young adult was to be able to figure out what was really happening and then address it in a truthful way that was positive, uh, positive minded. You know, even if something is shitty, like like sexual assault, we were talking about the other day. Obviously, nobody wants to be sexually assaulted. I didn't want to be sexually assaulted. I didn't want all the freaking baggage that came with that. But there's got to be a piece of that. I can't live a life where that is only bad. Right. I can't do that. So I have to look at that really bad thing and figure out how to learn from it. Mm -hmm. Because if you can learn from the really bad things, I think that your growth is exponential. Because when you stop learning from the bad things, you stop growing. So everybody has a bad thing. Not all of them are the same level as sexual assault. Maybe you had a bad boss who made you feel so bad about yourself, you didn't know whether to shit or get off the pot. Mm -hmm. But if you can look at that and go, what from this bad experience can I learn from and grow? Then, then you're on the right track. Then you can get out of that, or you can, or you can address your own. If it's a situation you can't get into, uh, get out of, like you have a sibling who you just don't see eye to eye with. If you can figure out a way to grow from that negativity, I think you're a better person. And in being a better person, it draws better things and better people to you. Isn't that the goal? That's so beautiful because you could have been the maker of your own misery. A hundred percent. So many people are. So many people are, but you decided to go the positive route. And some people don't even think about that route. They can't even. They can't see it. It doesn't register for them. And they just become like entrenched in this misery that they've kind of perpetuated because they don't think about what can I learn from this and what can I grow from this? What I learned from your openness about that actually um, is that you were sexually assaulted I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> when kidding. I gave birth, it brought back some traumatic, uh, it triggered, it triggered a lot. Traumatic. No, but I learned that, yeah. that if you are like sexually assaulted as a woman and you give birth, that can bring back oh, yeah. that trauma. And I didn't, it makes sense. But well, no one told me that I, it, yeah. no one told me that would happen. Yeah. I was just sitting with my feelings going, what the fuck is happening? Something is happening. So the the curiosity piece about it, where you go, this is not breaking me. This is not killing me, but I am not right. Yeah. Something's not right. Why? And to be able to figure that out, I hope to God, just having that conversation of saying, hey, when I gave childbirth, it triggered all this trauma from sexual assault. Someone may be in that same place and it will shortcut them to getting help. You know, whatever that help may be, reading a book or just letting it go. Mm-hmm. You know, at a certain point, I, when I was able to identify that's what was happening, half of it went away, you know, where you yes. just went, oh, that's what this is about. When you can pinpoint it, you can like work through it. Totally. And if you can't pinpoint something, you don't know why you're feeling that way, which is like another subject I want to talk to you about, like what's well, changed my life. But staying on this, um, you can't figure your shit out if you don't know what the shit is you know Mm -hmm. what i mean Mm -hmm. and um because of doing episodes like postpartum and stuff like that um i was able to ask my sister after she had kids like are are you experiencing this and Mm -hmm. like maybe not everyone is asking her those questions and so it was so cool because i i learned so much where i wouldn't have looked up postpartum depression right because i'm not going to give birth right maybe i would have looked it up if and when Brooke gives birth, right, um, or we have a kid, but when I'm 26 or 27, yeah. and nobody, my sister didn't, hadn't had kids, right. She was two years away from having kids at that point, and so like doing those episodes where I get to listen to them and listen to two women um, who have experienced that talk about their experience is huge yeah and so i'm like 
do you feel like throwing your daughter against the wall right now or yeah, something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, you know? And she would, you know, answer. And, um, and it just helps everybody. Right. It's so cool. It is cool. I love this podcast. Yeah. And, you know, I was going back through all the episodes we did and I thought some of these topics should be revisited with other people. Yes. Right. So I have other people in my life who have depression mm -hmm. and postpartum mm -hmm. and who have divorce mm -hmm. and who have financial problems mm -hmm. and who have all these episodes because I sometimes feel like, well, I've already talked about everything. Like, what else am I going to talk about? Um, but I think some things, you know, deserve to be revisited with other people because other people's experiences will be different and some the same, which is also interesting. If, you know, when one of the most powerful moments I had was sitting with Christina Pushinsky in Hawaii, our husbands were performing and we were talking about our childhood and our moms are so similar and our experience being only children with these moms that were just beautiful and moms had clear mental health issues and dads who were like men of the earth, drive a forklift mechanic people. Uh, and to have such similar experiences made me go, okay, this is actually, n I'm not special per se. I am, I am experiencing something other people experience also. It's very isolating to feel special in that way. Maybe special is the wrong word. And how old were you when... You had this first conversation with another person who you could relate to. Like 32, yeah. 33. That's a long time. It's a long time to sit and think you're the only person on the planet yeah. who has a parent like that. Yeah. And you have no resource to, to read a book or find out, oh, wait a minute. I had that too. We were literally like, oh my God. We literally were sitting at the pool in a hotel going, oh my God. You had that too? Huge. It was crazy. Yeah. So I feel like even if we did another episode on divorce and those people had the same things to say, then you go, oh, okay, well, this is kind of the way it works mm. for most people. Even with talking to Ruth about suicide, mm -hmm. she was so shocked to go into group counseling and find out that almost everyone in her group had the same experience that she thought was unique to her family yeah. and was kind of the standard. It's so helpful to know that you're not alone. I mean, it's huge. You're but, providing that to thousands of people who have like, with your openness, experience these things. Well, that's what I wanted. I mean, that's what I want. And I'm not a therapist. The thing is, I'm just a regular person who had a deep desire to be happy. Yeah. And was unhappy. Yeah. And didn't know how to get from A to B. Okay. I'm going to say something my therapist said to me this morning. Let me see if I can remember. It was so brilliant. I want to write it down and I, I, I keep forgetting to write it down. So I'm going to put it here. She said, wait, shit, I've already forgotten it. The distance between expectation and reality is the depth of your unhappiness. Let me hear that again. That's what I said to her. I said, yep. you got to say that one more time. Yep. The distance between your expectation and reality is the depth of your unhappiness. So if your yeah. expectation is A and your reality is B, the distance between those is the same depth of your unhappiness. Yep. That is so true. The farther away it is, the heavier the load. That's right. So living in reality and tempering your expectations based on your reality gets you closer to happy, right? So if you're expecting your husband who drops flossers all over the house when they've been used and you and walk the through the house studio. and the podcast studio... <laughs> And to the point, and in your friend's house, and in the bus, <laughs> and on the street, and then the driveway. Yep. If my expectation is for that to change, I'm going to be really unhappy. So I have to figure out what my expectation is for that. Right. And then that will raise my level of happiness, right? Mm. Yes, that is a real circumstance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you could tell. Yep. But yeah. So that one statement, there's so many statements like that that happen in life that if you could just own them in your psyche, mm -hmm. if you could put them in your little programming and go, oh, okay, maybe I'm expecting too much from my boss um, or from my coworker or from my husband. You know, I just saw this thing Chris Rock said on Instagram where he was talking about marriage and how marriage is, is hard and that you're a partner. And he said something to the, to the effect of, you know, 
you're in a band. Sometimes you're the lead singer and sometimes you play tambourine. Mm. But you got to be good at both. You better be the best tambourine player on the planet because eventually you'll be back to being the lead singer. And if you know that, then your expectation is this ebbs and flows instead of thinking I am this and you are that and that's the way it works. It's that way in every relationship with your boss, with your friends, with your spouse, with your children. Sometimes you play the tambourine and yeah. sometimes you play the cowbell. <laughs> How about that? I like cowbell better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Docatot. Mamas, if you're expecting, have a newborn or are looking for a gift, we have the perfect items for you. Docatot is the lifestyle brand made for the modern parent and creates functional solutions for feeding, playing, resting, sleeping, lounging, and beyond. From their adorable sleeping essentials to the whimsical play tents and nursing pillows that double as home decor, the Docatot brand grows with families through every stage and every phase. Pregnant sleeping sucks. You cannot find a good spot to save your life. And then postpartum, you know, once you have a baby, Everything doesn't just immediately go back to normal. It's also hard to find a, a happy spot when you're postpartum as well. So Docatot has something called the Cosset Pillow. Finding the right sleep position when you're pregnant or postpartum is no easy task. And the Cosset Pillow offers supportive sleep and positioning for anybody in your household. I mean, do you really have to be pregnant to find a comfortable position with the Cosset Pillow? I don't think so. If you're breastfeeding, La Mom and Wedge is designed to decrease neck and back strain, and it's great for nursing or it's great for bottle feeding. And what's really cool about Docatot is the fabrics they use to cover their La Mom and Wedge, their cosset pillow, their rompers, their sleep sacks, their stuff for babies, their swaddles. All of this kind of goes with your home decor. Um, you know, it's awesome to have stuff covered in lambs or baby chickens. I think that stuff's adorable might not exactly go with my home decor. And you know, when you're nursing, I breastfed my daughters for a year. That nursing pillow was out and about in my life for a year. Wouldn't it be nice to have a La Mom and Wedge that just kind of goes with your decor? I think so. And the same with the Cosset pillow. Hey, you may decide after your postpartum is, is down the line, you just want to keep sleeping in comfort. Wouldn't you like a pillow that kind of went with your decor? I would. So Docatot, awesome fabric options. Great supports for mom, for baby, and cute little sleep sacks and rompers for baby. Can't go wrong. Looking for a gift or if you're a new mom, Docatot's a great place to go. Babies, mamas, and gift givers. This is the best brand you can buy for the precious child and mom you love most. For a limited time, get 15% off at Docatot.com with the code WIFE. That's 15% off with the code WIFE at Docatot.com. Parenting is hard, but Docatot makes it easier. So right, right? what are your favorite episodes? Mm. You were looking back on some of them. Well, I always have fun with the friends they're drinking. You've only done like one of those in person and another one over Zoom. I know. I mean, we tried to do it again over the holidays and I couldn't get it done because everybody's schedule. Yeah, that was nuts. But drinking with friends was a good one recapping vietnam was really fun yeah uh because we had such a good time in vietnam and there were so many uh tales to tell on that one um i love talking to terry diaz yeah it was so great talking to her she's i think she's very similar to me in that she's a very regular person who's married to a very irregular person yeah and that's another one of those moments where i got to really kind of see you know, see somebody like myself a little bit. It was really cool. We're about to do another one. Yes. In the series of Married to Comics mm -hmm. with um, Brian Posehn's wife. Yes. Very exciting. Melanie. And that's, yeah, I'm excited about that because although like Brian isn't like Bert and Joey, he's still a com comic yeah. who's been on the road for 20 years yeah. and is like different than a quote normal person totally so and she has the unique experience of being a um a manager as well mm. so she's 
I don't want to give it, you know, too yeah. much away. I want you to. We're talking about. I that. want you to talk to her yeah, about. Yeah. It. I know her because yeah. she's Ron Funch's manager, and so I've I've known her for like four years, and um, she's the sweetest. You're gonna have like a great conversation. Wait. I'm I'm super excited. Next yeah, week is an awesome week of podcasting. I can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I like the drinking ones. I like talking about Vietnam. Um, I really like the 20s, 30s, 40s mm. episode. That's Me one too. of my favorites. Yeah. Um, I went back and watched that. That's with um, Jeannie. Uh huh. And um, I don't remember now. Kathy? No. Kathy. Yeah, Kathy. Jeannie and Kathy. I was blanking in my mind there. Yeah. I was watching it this morning. So that's how Were good really? my memory is. Yeah. I was like, I started it last night and then while well, I was making dinner and then I, I popped it on this morning when I was making breakfast too. And um, so when we recorded that, I was 26 and now uh -huh. I'm 31. So I got a little bit of a different perspective. I still had the second half of my 20s to live at that point. Yeah. And so listening to you guys talk about that was really, really cool. And um, I thought that it was interesting that that Jeannie was like, my friends were dreading turning 30 and I couldn't wait to get out of my 20s. Yeah. And she talked about why and like how she met her husband mm -hmm. and like her um first boyfriend who was like cheating on her and stuff like that i have a note about that one um so she said her 20s weren't great because of her ex but she also said that she wouldn't have had the courage to move to la mm -hmm. without him mm -hmm. and you said something to the effect of you know people are in your life for like a reason a season or a lifetime mm -hmm. and that person was in her life for a reason mm -hmm. and um just her reflecting on that was was cool to hear yeah i thought that that was really interesting everyone's got a different life story and your friends are cool man your friends are cool my friends are amazing i like listening to them let me tell you about my friends mm. I was just talking to Bert's manager last night, actually. Um, and she said, you know, going forward in her life, she's wants to spend more time with, with women, uh, with friends that she works or she goes home to her husband and she sleeps and she feels like that's, you know, she's been just working her whole life. And I said, you know, I wouldn't spend nearly as much time with my friends if I didn't have this podcast because we're all so busy. Mm -hmm. So I kind of built in unknowingly built in this, constant uh way of keeping up with my friends but i i said to her last night as you age you are supposed to develop skills where you can suss people out really quickly uh, if you're healthy when you start doing that you start breaking cycles right so if you are constantly in a, a relationship with a friend who takes advantage of you or makes you feel drained or takes more than they give or is manipulative or lies or makes you feel unstable. That's all something you experience in your twenties and is totally normal. But if you are a self-reflective person, usually people start weeding that out, you know, unless that's something that works for you, but that was never anything that worked for me. So by the time I got to be my, in my thirties, I got really good at recognizing real people who were genuine, real, non-agended people. And so I did, I had my success in friendships, my experience of friendships from my thirties to my fifties has been only positive. It's just been so positive. And I think that's part of that mental health piece where you have to know yourself. You know, when Bert and I were first dating and he wouldn't call me his girlfriend, I literally said to him, listen, I have been to the rodeo. I have seen the show. You're either going to call me your girlfriend or I'm leaving because I am your girlfriend. So you're either going to be my boyfriend or I'm fucking leaving. And he's like, you're my girlfriend. You're my girlfriend. You're my girlfriend. <laughs> I was like, thank you. I mean, I'm 30 fucking two. What are you going to say? This is my friend, Leanne. I've seen you every day for the past three months. I'm your girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> so either that or I'm leaving. So I've kind of developed into that person in my early thirties and apply that to every relationship. And maybe that's 
maybe that's not healthy, but it sure does make me happy. It takes a lot of bullshit out. And I got really lucky in that we moved into a neighborhood with people who are very similar. None of my friends have bullshit friends. None of them. Like every, I go to every friend's house and you go, yeah, I like all our friends. That was good. We just had a New Year's Eve party and Sandy and I co-hosted. And I looked at this party and there were people there I did not know that were in Sandy's world and they were all lovely. They were all nice. No one was pretentious. No one was stinky. No, a couple people threw up, but I think that's just because we had a really and good time. And that was stinky. But- that was stinky, but, <laughs> but I was like, wow, that's, we built this group, but it's because this group exists in the world, right? I didn't make all those people good people. They are good people. And so when you're a good person and you live by those standards, I believe, maybe this isn't everybody's experience, but it's been my experience that that's what you draw to you. Other people show up, but you don't have to keep them. You can cordially not keep them. There's plenty of people in my life that I have fine relationships with that are acquaintances. Totally fine. I don't have beef with anybody. You don't have to be an asshole to not hang out with somebody. You can be very kind and not hang out with somebody. And if someone takes that personally, that's on them. But if you behave in a way that is uh, means no harm, you know, then then you mean no harm. And if someone doesn't get it, then that's on them because people are always going to not get stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, not taking things personally is another big thing that I do. I don't take anything personally. That's huge. It's huge. It's like one of my favorite life skills that I learned. Yeah. And I just, I'm, I've been slowly like teaching Brooke that as uh-huh. well. And it's huge. Not huge. The, it's one of the four agreements. It is. From Don Miguel Ruiz. Uh-huh. And uh, who just had a heart transplant. He did. I heard. Oh, my. Yeah. And uh, he survived. That's amazing. Yeah, huge. Uh, but not taking things personally. When I read that, I was like 20. Or 19. Yeah. And it's been a practice and practice and practice and practice. I tell myself all the time, mm, we don't need to take that personally. Yeah. That's not, that's not really me. That it's not on me. That's what they're going through or what they're they have an experience that is way different than what's going on in my world. And uh, I'm just not gonna take that one personally. And right. I let it go. Yeah. And there's like so much freedom in that there is and then what happens in that is when you do start taking something personally there's a reason yeah because you're practiced at not yes so if you're practiced at this is nothing to do with me what's the issue what's the fact right so when if you go what's the issue what's the fact and you still are taking something personally then something's wrong yes then you can address it yeah so it's such a great tool to just practice not taking anything personally not that you don't let people run over you That's not what that means. What that means is you just, if someone says no, they don't want to go to lunch, you don't assume it's because they don't like you. Right. You just go, well, they just can't go to lunch. So, okay, well, if I ask them again and they say no, then maybe I'll go, huh, I wonder if something's wrong. None of this is me personally. It's just me being curious. Well, I wonder why. Well, let me see why. Maybe it's, maybe it's nothing to do with me. Maybe. Your first instinct is to get curious. Uh-huh. And I love that about you. Uh-huh. And that's not always my first instinct. I am my father's son yeah. and he knows. He you know? knows what do you mean? He knows like He already has the answer. He's got the answer. Uh-huh. You know? Like uh he's like a a dude that way. Yeah. Um to put it like broad, I guess. Um now he's not really like that anymore. Like he was that as like a parent of young kids, sure. right? Of course. But I feel like um getting curious is such a more healthy yeah. way to go about things. And I see that's how you parent Georgia and Isla too, is that you get curious and then try to find the answer. I try. Even if you might already know the answer. I do. Usually yeah. already know the answer. Yeah. But, you know, it's such a, a human being is such a stew. You know, there's so many things in a stew that makes a stew work. <clears throat> Part of that 
is my dad. My dad's always been curious. Part of that is how I showed up on the planet. I've always been curious. I've always asked questions. My dad would say, you're exhausting me with the questions. You have to stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is something that can be learned. I, I, don't, I don't believe that being curious is innate only. You can learn to be curious. You can yeah. learn to stop yourself mm -hmm. and turn your statement into a question. And if you start turning your, like, he hates me into, do you hate me? Or do you have a problem with me? Or do we have a problem? Or is there something I should know instead of he hates me? You know, it's it's a very simple shift, but it's very hard. I'm not saying it's not it's not hard. It's hard. It takes a lot of attention and focus and to pay attention to your inner thoughts and dialogue. But it's something that you can do is to just make every statement a question. And if you start making every statement a question, this is where Bert and I bump heads parenting. Bert will come in and go. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example that hasn't really happened, so I don't blow anybody's cover for anything. But he'll come in and go like, she didn't do the laundry. And I'll go, well, why? And he'll go, well, I mean, it doesn't matter why. She just didn't do it. And I went, but there may be a reason. Like, don't just assume she's an asshole. Let's ask her, hey, why didn't you do the laundry? Yeah. And then she'll say, oh, my God, my lacrosse practice went late and I completely forgot. Okay, I forget shit all the time. Now, do I need to beat the hell out of her uh, emotionally because she forgot? No. Now I go, well, you know, I really needed that laundry. So let's get it done now. How about that? Yeah. And then she'll do it. Whereas Bert thinks that approach is letting her walk all over me. Where I think that approach is letting her come to the conclusion on her own, which is a more effective way to learn. Now, it's not to say that maybe she needs both styles. Maybe she needs somebody to come in and go, that was a big screw up. You screwed up. But that's just not how I work. Yeah. So that's awesome. And like, that's exactly what I mean by how my dad worked. Uh -huh. It's not like he was, he was an amazing parent. Like I love my dad so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we all do. And all our parents are flawed. Yeah. And it's not even like a huge flaw yeah. even, but it's still like, I still have to fight that instinct mm -hmm. to know the answer. Like he, is a cop and a military brain right. guy. And so his like, he's got the answers, yeah, right? Yeah. Cause he had to in his job. Has to. Yeah. It's like life or death. Totally. And, um, and he, he didn't always parent like a cop, but, um, I still feel that I have to force myself to get curious instead of pretending like I know the answer. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> or, I do. Like, because of, ego or habit 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 it's a lot of habit um it's a muscle just yes. like anything else mm -hmm. curiosity is like a muscle curiosity is like a muscle I it is that. i love that you you have to work it out so if you yeah you just have to work it out um i can't imagine what life would be without curiosity it's part of the reason i like problem solving is because I'm like, well, how do we do this? I was just joking with Jennifer the other day where I was like, we're the, we're the people that goes like, I got this. I got this. We got this. We got this. Oh, you want to build a podcast studio in like a month and a half? I got this. I got this. And then I go, how do I got this? Like, how do I get this done? Not, I don't get into, oh my God, this is awful. I'm so overwhelmed. There's no way I can make it. I never say that. I say, how do I get from A to B? That's curiosity again. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, I have a goal. How do I meet this goal? So it doesn't have to be an emotional goal. It can be a project based goal. It can be a weight loss goal. It can be it can be whatever you have. If you're curious about something to me, fact finding is much more interesting than drudgery. Right. So you could look at building a podcast studio as drudgery. There's so much work. I'm so overwhelmed. Right. I can't believe I have all this to do. But if you look at it, like fact finding, like treasure hunting, you go, how do I find this? Who can run my cable? How, who knows a gaffer? Where do I get this couch? Mm -hmm. Where can I, how, what do I want this to look like? And when you start firing your brain into that curiosity space, you're more motivated to fulfill the task. Now it's the same task as if my brain went to drudgery. The, sta the task is the same. I don't enjoy drudgery. Yeah, and then, but you're not like all stressed out and anxious and angry as you would be if you were drudgery. stressed out and anxious. 
still. Yeah, but, but in a curious way. You're not sulking in it. I'm not angry. Yeah. I'm not resentful. Right. I'm not. Uh, I don't lash out. I'm not frustrated. Not usually. So of course I'm not perfect. And there's sometimes where my cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if I can keep everything in that curiosity lane, then then the hard work becomes less work, more play. Because isn't play curiosity, right? Play is play yeah. is free. Yeah. And if you can find a way to make drudgery play, it's the same task. But the emotional process of that task is so much lighter if it's play. So I would I used to pretend I was a waitress all the time when I was a little girl. I thought it was awesome. And then I became a waitress. It's one of the hardest jobs ever. Uh, just to temper your emotions in that job, to maintain composure when you're slammed, to maintain composure when someone's an asshole yeah. is a real acrobatic feat, you know, to be able to also keep track of who ordered what at what table and what position on the table and who needs a drink and who doesn't and what's the busboy doing. There's a lot that could spiral you out. So I think, I don't think I consciously did this. I think I subconsciously made it play so that I could enjoy it because I'm not going to spend every day at a restaurant miserable. Yep. You know? Yeah. Play is, play is so powerful. If you can frame your life as a big playground, Yep. then you're happier in the playground mm -hmm. than you are in prison. Amen. You know? I'm a musician. I yeah. play. Yeah. I play a lot. Yeah. I play. And I, that's kind of, it's not a recent discovery. It's more of like a recent conscious decision now. Yeah. Whereas before I got into, I went to school and I'm like, I, I, I got to learn all this theory. And it's like, it's, it's now, now it's homework. Right. Now it's practice. Yeah. Now it's drudgery. Drudgery. Yeah. Right. And so once I let that go, and it's not work anymore. Right. It's play. Right. It's play. And I, I love it. And guess what? My videos and music and stuff are doing better than ever. That's, a, as that's soon right. As I started playing. You know why? Because people can see that. Yeah. When you show up at your day job that mm -hmm. you don't like and you're playing, yeah. everybody's happier. Yep. Everybody. And then guess what? You inspire other people to play. Yep. Because being who you are inspires other people to be who they are. Yeah. And if you decide part of who I am is playful. Mm -hmm. then that inspires other people to be playful. Yeah. Even if it's hard. Writing songs is, for me is hard. It's not easy all the time. No. And it's hard to be consistent with everything that goes along with posting videos and recording music and writing and, and all that stuff on top of um, another editing schedule. Sometimes the last thing I want to do is edit my own videos when I've edited <laughs> sure. other videos. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, I just need to kind of decompress and not be on the computer anymore. And um, so what I started doing is just playing. Yeah. Right. And so it's so much more free and it's so much more fun. And I've written, I wrote more songs last year than I, than I did the previous Amazing. three, four years. Because I was like, I felt like I finally got to play now. I right. moved into a new apartment that I have my own studio now. I have my own room. Mm -hmm. And there's guitars hanging up on the wall, a piano, a drum set. I got all the recording. I got a new camera. And every corner of my room is a little ADHD playground for different musical instruments and different ways to write. And it's, and it's play. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So That's very um, cool. I yeah, that's kind of a recent um, discovery, I guess, for me as a person. Um, what I have a question for you. Yeah. What what's like the biggest thing you learned from doing so many podcasts with Georgia and Isla? That's a really good question. Um, I learned. I learned how how emotionally intelligent they both are. Yeah. They have an emotional intelligence that I am so proud of. I also learned that they are, I don't know how to say this. This is not the right way maybe to say it, but they're like 
they're good with me. They're good with their dad. And not a lot of kids are good with their parents, you know, but they are. And that they're not only good with me, they're good with adults in general. And that made me really proud. But yeah, their emotional intelligence and knowing who they are, like as I live with them, I think they know who they are. But when, you, you know, conversations on a podcast are very different than they are. We don't sit around and talk about some of this stuff. I try to talk about some of this stuff, but they don't, they're not interested. But again, with the vision, my vision of this podcast, I've always said to them, the reason I have you on here is so that people can experience my relationship with my kids and two kids who are pretty amazing and have a lot to say. And so maybe a parent at home who's struggling with a kid who has a learning disability can watch me and you talk about your learning disability and learn something about their kid. That's the purpose. It's not to be, again, exposition-y. It's not to be like, here are my kids. It's a deeper purpose than that. And we, I believe, and maybe as, no, I'm not even gonna say that. I believe I have a really good relationship with my kids and it's not a mistake. It's because I worked my ass off to have one Mm -hmm. because I plugged in and I never unplugged and ever unplugged. And I'm so proud of that relationship. And I think that it, is possible for every parent and child. It's possible for everybody. So if you can see, we're not perfect, by the way. There's still times I don't understand either one of them. I'm super frustrated with Georgia right now because she's not getting back to me from college. She's she's just completely MIA. And I'm fucking frustrated with her. And I've let her know that. So it's not like she's the perfect child. That's not what I mean. She's lied to me. She's snuck behind my back and done things and broke the rules. She's been grounded. She, you know, Isla's the same. They're, they, they suck sometimes. But I think that's also part of a real relationship. Mm-hmm. And I feel so lucky that they are so emotionally intelligent. And I think Perhaps it's because I am emotionally intelligent and so is their dad in a lot of ways. He seems very bra to the outside world, but when you boil it down, he's very self-reflective. He may be reactionary, but he can usually come back to what's really going on and adjust and pivot or apologize or change his behavior. Not always, but that's an emotional intelligence also. So I think they're in this family structure where we are all very communicative and we are um, we allow each other to be our own person for the most part. I think Bert sometimes has a hard time when the kids don't do what he says, whereas I see it as a personality difference. He sees it as defiance, and that's mm-hmm. someplace that we disconnect sometimes. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he has to really bring me into know they're being defiant for me to really understand it because I just think they're just different than me. Mm. You know, I would never do ABC, but I don't have anxiety or I don't have dyslexia or I don't have fill in the blank. Yeah. So why would I ever impose my way of life on their person? And he's going, no, I recognize myself in that action. I know what she's doing. Yes. And she's doing ABC where I don't think that way. So Um, But yeah, I think that's what I've learned is that how emotionally intelligent they actually are, which makes me feel really good about their future. Yeah. You know? Oh, I I read a lot of the comments and so many people are like, Georgia is so mature. First time she did this podcast, she was 13. What? (laughs) That's insane. I have to go back and watch it again. Not crazy. It is. I saw like an old picture from the Man Cave of You 3 that I had. And they're babies. Yeah. I mean, Isla's 11. Yeah. And Georgia's 13. Yeah. And Isla laid practically on the couch. Babies. And talked like from the side. <laughs> she still does that. I know. She's, right? <laughs> she'll be like this. She's so funny. <laughs> She's a creature of comfort. Let me tell you. That one's a comfort seeking creature. Um, yeah. So I think that I really enjoy my podcast with Bert too, because I think that I learn a lot about marriage and like relationship of, again, it's your guys' ultra openness. Well, we're really married. You're really married. I mean, it's not, it's not a joke. No. That, and when I say that. No. It sounds r- ridiculous, but uh, we're really married. Like this is like, <laughs> it's a real marriage. There's no, yeah, we're really married. And by that, you mean you 
you work on stuff together, you mm-hmm. go through things together, you sort through the bullshit and you get through the disagreements and the fights and the, not that you guys are fighting all the time, but. And we have um, fun. Exactly. And we party yep. and we work together and yeah. we, yeah, we have a, it's a marriage. It's real. It's very real. And I think that, um, I didn't have an example of a real marriage. Uh, not really. Yeah. Uh, my grandparents were not super happily married. My parents divorced multiple times. And my aunts, I have a couple aunts and uncles that were married, but they weren't what I saw as ideal. Um, they're still married and happy. It worked for them. And that's wonderful. But it wasn't what I wanted. So I feel like, Bert, listen. Marriage is about seeing who your partner is. It's, again, that same thing my therapist said to me today. Your expectations, the distance between your expectations and reality is the depth of your unhappiness. If you can't really see and love and accept your partner, you're fucked. That's it. So if you can see them and you can't accept them, you're not in the right place. You know, not that there's not flaws. I hate that Bert leaves his flossers everywhere. But am I going to ditch somebody because they leave their flossers everywhere? I'm not. Now, someone else, that might be a deal breaker. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I see that that's never changing. I see that he is always going to have anxiety. I see that he's always going to react before he thinks. I see those things and I accept them. And that is why I'm happy. But if I saw them and I fought them, I would be unhappy. Bert was talking about a comedian who was engaged and he was in a hotel room with his fiance, and she took a shit in the bathroom and they broke up. What? <laughs> yeah. Did he, he think she did not have bowel movements? I don't know. He just was like, You're going to do that in front of me? I'm out. You're an animal. How dare you? Right. That's what I mean. That's it. But he knows himself and he knows his expectations and he can't deal with that. <laughs> right. I think it's crazy, <laughs> but I'm not him. Yeah. Is that really something you can't deal with? Well, maybe you should address that before you marry anybody. Because yeah, exactly. guess what? Every woman's going to take a shit. Yeah. And guess what? One time she's going to get the stomach flu and she's going to shit everywhere. Yeah. And you're going to have to figure that one out. Yep. So <laughs> Bert had the stomach flu once and literally shit the bed and, and threw up in the sink on the way to the toilet to shit in the floor and throw up in the toilet. And in the middle of it, he looked at me and he goes, I would never do this for you. <laughs> And I was like, I know, but I also probably would never have this reaction or this lack of self-control to be able to not make it to the toilet with a garbage can. I would, that would never be me. That has never happened to me. Yeah. I haven't experienced that either. Never shit on the floor. Oh, he, I think it was, he's done it multiple he times. He did the wrong thing. You sit on the toilet and throw up in the garbage. You can't shit yep. in the garbage while you're throwing in the toilet. He just was so, the, the, the urgency was the vomit. Not, he again, reactionary, not thinking things. Do you through. think the vomit made him shit? Oh, he shit the bed first, which made him vomit. Oh my so, God. <laughs> it was bad. It was a long time ago. And literally he looked up from the toilet and said, I would never do this for you. I could never do this for you. <laughs> that man has shat on every surface of this world. He might have walls. Some, he might have some bowel syndrome problems. <laughs> he might have some legit shit problems. Toilets, walls, yeah, floors, yeah, underside of toilets. I don't even know how that happens. Yeah, it's a splatter. It's something. It just evacuates. It's bad. But right, yeah, moving on. Yeah, moving um, on. From- <laughs> what else was your favorite? Um, is it bad if I pour a little more of this magnum? Please give me some. Um, uh, I should probably eat something. So I, my favorite quotes of yours, oh God. and there are a few, but one of my favorites is when you said, TikTok, big girl, when them britches coming off. What? What was that for? <laughs> you were, I think you were talking about Bert um, being eager for sex or something like that. Right. And you're like quoting him as if he would say that, right? TikTok, big girl, TikTok. When the bridge is coming off. That's really funny. TikTok, big girl, when bridge is coming off. And then recently you were like, my daddy always told me that I could talk to a doorknob about navel lint. <laughs> That's a good one, right? <laughs> yeah. I told that to Brooke and she goes, what does that mean? Ah! I was like, she could talk to anybody about anything. anything. Yes, I can talk to a doorknob about navel lint for sure. She took it so literal. I know, right? 
I could, I could do that. Actually, that's so funny. TikTok, big girl, take your britches off. When them britches coming off. TikTok, when them britches. Big girl. <laughs> I, I, wanna, make... I better have a bunch of quotables. I have, really I have so talk out of my ass sometimes. I feel like I just blah blah blah. Those are just the ones that I like that just came to my mind. Numb and Dumb first. is one of my favorites from Christina. That's Rumbly. a great one. Rumbly is one of my favorite guests because she, like me, is an open book. She holds her own against some of the funniest comedians in the world. And I've done podcasts with all of them. Yeah. And she is funnier than a good 25% of them. She's amazing. Or more. Yeah. She's so funny. She is so funny. And she's such a great person. She's just a good human being. Again, I find these good human beings. Yeah. They all seem to have some quirks and eccentricities. But I'm very quirky, I think. I'm very... I'm not regular. Maybe I'm not quirky, but I'm definitely not a regular girl. You know, I'm just yeah. not regular. So, yeah, I love when Rumbly comes on because I know it's going to be a great, fun, funny conversation. And we always end up talking about something really meaningful. Yeah. In the middle of this humor and her naked guy talk last it's... time was killing me. Oh, it's naked guy. Naked guy. Do you think I want those things on my face? Just naked guy, naked guy. Oh That's if. That's what's happening, really. Made that a clip so fast. She's she so was, funny. She is so freaking funny. I, I love it when she comes over. I think she's done it like five times. Has she? I think so. She loves it. So that's the thing, too, is I, I have a lot of friends who could talk to a doorknob about navel lint a lot. Which is awesome. Jeannie could talk to anybody, anytime, uh, again, all day long. One of the loveliest humans, again. Jeannie's She's just so the most sweet. generous, kind, giving, loving, cares so much about the people in her life. I really like Jeannie a lot. I see her all the time. In I, the hood? I, I do, yeah. I, I do my neighborhood walks. Uh-huh. And um, I pass by her house every time I, I do my walk. It's just the best. Right down the street from my place. And um, she, yeah, she feels like a, a friend to me too. Uh-huh. And she knows about my life. And yeah about Brooke and she yeah. waves to both of us and says, Hey, we chat for a little bit and catch up real quick and then on our merry way. But yeah, your friends have become like my friends too, in a way, right. in that way, you know, whenever I see them. And one time I was walking around and there was a lady on a, on our bike and she goes, you're Halston. And she goes, I'm listening to wife uh, of the party right now. I bet I know who it was. Mary. Marion. Marion. Yeah, she's amazing. I love her so much. She's probably listening. She is one. She, every time you see her, she's happy. Yeah. Every time you see her, she has something positive to say. Oh. She was a big volunteer at school when I was a volunteer at school. And I just, every time I see her coming, it makes me happy. She's just a lovely human being. I don't know what it is about this neighborhood we moved into. Everybody I came in contact with pretty much were just lovely human beings. We could be anywhere. We could be in Denver. We could be in Arkansas. It, it, it doesn't feel like we're in L.A. It feels like, not that I don't like L.A. I love L.A. But this particular neighborhood draws really grounded, down-to-earth, genuine, neighborly people. Um, and all these friends, not all of them, but all these friends we're talking about now are from this neighborhood. Margaret, I knew Margaret Schmidt, I knew um, from before I knew Bert. Um, Christine Pierce, who hasn't been a guest. I need to get her on as a guest. She She's a friend of mine from before Bert. Um, I never wanted to ask her to come because she lives so far away. <laughs> I feel so bad because I'm not paying anybody. They're just coming to be to talk to me. Um, that I've never asked her because I'd hate to ask her to drive all the way up here. But I think I should. I think it's long overdue. I, yeah, I years. love, I love, I love like what you've built with this, I, and I'm so lucky that I get to be a part of it. And like, if I wouldn't have been doing this, I wouldn't have known Jeannie. And so, right, it's so cool that I have that little like piece of neighborhood. Yeah, I get you. You're sharing it with me too. Well, it's so cool, and I feel like I'm friends with your friends a little bit. You know, with with Kathy, seeing her all the time, and Kirsten, and I. I follow them on social media and I see what they're doing yeah. and, and um, Jocelyn's come over a bunch too. And she's like, you got to watch mythic quest. And I finally got to it. And yeah. it's so funny. Is it? And now I think about her all the time whenever I'm watching it. I'm like, I can't wait to talk to her about this. That's and awesome. yeah, it's like so cool. I get to like share that with them. Um, well, that makes people. me really happy. Yeah, I know I have, I have great friends. And part of my vision was to share my friends with the world because they are so 
everybody is so accomplished in their own right. And I don't mean accomplished like they make a lot of money, but they're accomplished in that they're all happy, well-balanced people. That's an accomplishment to me is that. You know a lot of those. Yeah, I do. That's all I fuck with. I don't fuck with people who are not. Yeah, but you know really a lot well of them. I do. Like you'll, you a new name will come up on the schedule, and I'll be like, I don't know who that is, and then it's another person who's like, cool and right. accomplished in their own right, and and I'm real so and lucky. nice, and like it's so awesome. I'm so lucky. What's your favorite uh, book club book you've done? Oh God. Oh no. I don't know. I wonder how many book clubs we've done. I think you've done about 30 something. No, not I that many. I think I counted. Really? I think so. No. I think no so. No way. I think I counted them. I don't know what my favorite would be. That's a really good question. I know. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think. It's hard to answer that question because there are books that I liked reading and there are books that I like discussing. But mm. I didn't necessarily like the book, yeah. right? So like like the book made. I liked that discussion. I don't know why. I can't but that's what's popping in my and the book A is for alibi. I hated that book. Yeah. But I loved that discussion. I remember that being a fun episode. I but- remember you guys discovering that book because Kirsten brought it up. I think it was on a Zoom podcast and she 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 was like kind of catching flack for her reading these mystery novels that is starting with A yep. and ends in Z. Not Z, because she died before Z. It ends uh, with Y. Oh, it ends with Y. Yeah. No. The author died before Z. Oh. <laughs> right? Incomplete. And you guys ended up doing A is for Alibi, and that's so funny. Yeah, it was awesome. I love talking to those ladies. And the one we just did was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. So That's being released in 45 minutes. Oh, nice. From now. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't know. None of them really super stand out, but, um, but that A is for alibi. I remember that being a funny episode. I think we also talked about a book that Bert was reading that I quoted from in one of the episodes. Do you remember that? And it was basically like a romance novel for men. For men. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I don't. Was it a James Patterson novel or something? It was something like that. Michael super Crichton, patriotic like oh. guy porn military porn like guy it like so funny ultra masculine and we read it out loud and it was hysterical. it was like you and the girls i think reading it out loud oh maybe i thought i talked about it in a podcast also i mean in a book club also it was know. on the table yeah yeah yeah. and i think right. you were with g yeah, and i, I. you're right i think you're right and i some i think one of them goes what is that and like they you guys started reading it yeah or something and you guys were cracking up I wish I could remember where that was or when that was. I know. It was a long time ago, but it was, I remember it being so freaking funny. It was. Miss Pat's book stands out to me. Oh, yeah. That was, yes, you're right. That was a, yeah, that was a favorite read for sure. Still want her to come talk about it, even though we talked about it a little bit. Yeah. In that podcast with her and Bert. I love Miss Pat. She's so nice. I love her two pieces. She's amazing human being. There are a few comedians that come on and come through and they give me a hug every time yeah. she's one of them she's an joe coy is one of them she is a national treasure and i know some people might watch miss pat and go why because she is because you should read her book rabbit mm-hmm. which is a memoir and that book uh that book changed you're right this is probably the best book we read that book changed my perspective and changed my opinion of myself, not for the better. I was embarrassed after I read that book about what I didn't know about the experience of African Americans in poverty in Georgia specifically, but in the United States kind of broadly. I was embarrassed and I apologized to Pat for not understanding. And I felt like it shifted my paradigm so extreme, extremely and open it opened my eyes and uh, yeah that was one of the most powerful books i've actually read in a while so you're right i forgot sorry i forgot miss pat I forgot about you that. you mention it all all the time as being like one year uh, it was one of the standout books yeah it was crazy i can't remember what book you just mentioned on like the one i was listening to episode 18 you were talking about it in the beginning how you were about to read it shit 
it wasn't a Brene Brown. It was like it was another very popular the happiness s- self help book. No, yeah. mm. I can't remember. What I it was. don't know. Sorry. I should have wrote that down. Um, what was your favorite book club episode? Miss Pat's book for Ms. sure. Pat. Miss Pat's mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Any other memoirs like stand out to you? There's a few. Well, we read Made was a memoir. Yeah. Um, Forever. Is that a memoir? Forever is not a memoir. That is a novel. Oh. No, Forever is not a memoir. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we've read it. I think any I blocked that memoirs. one out. Forever? forever? <laughs> Kathy's daughter uh, read it and said it was smut. And then she read some real smut and said it was not smut. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. The girls finding the smut books at the lake house is so funny to me. Yeah, that episode talking about the lake visit was pretty good. Yeah. It was pretty funny. Uh huh. The Alabama trip, I think it's called. Is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. They want to go back, which is awesome. I'll totally do that trip again with them. It was so much fun. Uh, I, well, there's no way we can top the first one, though. I mean, they already know where the smut books are. <laughs> I would have loved to have had a hidden camera and seen them discover that house full of smut books and oh then take gosh. some home. And then so many in their suitcases came home. It's hysterical. Just like packed full. They have to like sit on it to Just get the smut. books down. <laughs> they read it out loud to each other. And then laugh is so funny. That is so adorable. Yeah. That's oh my really gosh. Cute. Well, to pivot, I guess, a little bit from uh, stuff with levity, I would say that. Um, and this podcast not only changed my life with my relationship, but also my mental health in a 180. Really? Huge. What is it? Huge. So four years ago, you did the podcast with Amy and Oksana mm-hmm. about depression. And I was 26. And um, I was a little bit less than a year into doing uh Burtcast and then starting life of the party and i was still feeling the way that i felt not all the time but when i was um at dominoes and trying to make something work for myself in this city and in this world i guess and um i thought that i felt so low all the time because i didn't like what i was doing Mm -hmm. and i just like was so frustrated and that was definitely part of it um but what made me realize that i actually had depression was amy and oksana talking about it Mm -hmm. and i was sitting there behind them at the time in the man cave and i was listening to them describe oksana was describing her experience with depression, super open and honest. You talked about how you had reached out to five different people and they all said no. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And Amy is an expert on it. Yeah. She's a a therapist. Yeah, she's a therapist. And um, at the time, I didn't know that there was a difference between therapist and psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. Didn't know. I didn't know. um, Pause right there. mm. If you didn't know, Lots of people didn't know. Yeah. There's a huge difference between those two people. Mm-hmm. There's so many different modalities in getting help. Yeah. I'm glad you said that out loud because there is a difference. There's a big difference. And I can't believe that that's when you learn that. That's amazing. I had never had a therapist before or a psychiatrist. Um, so the difference is one more focuses on your symptoms and prescribes medication for you based on their analysis. Psychiatrist? A psychiatrist does, yeah. Mm -hmm. And a therapist um, talks you through your issues that you're going through and helps to come up with solutions that are not medication-based. Right. Because they they can't prescribe medication. And there's so many different modalities to to be a psychologist or a um, MFT, a marriage and family a therapist, mm-hmm. or any kind of counselor that's not a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. There's so many different modalities uh, mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. So it's not, it can, it's talk therapy, it's cognitive behavioral therapy, it's this EMRT or whatever that I thing is. There's, I can't remember that, like, an 
acronym for it. Mm-hmm. But there's like Freudian type therapy. There's so many different types of therapy that that's just abroad. I didn't know that, yeah. you know, and I was. I didn't really know that either. It's which is so interesting stuff they should teach in school hello with investing and don't get me started on what cards. they should teach in school oh my god how to pay taxes what are they right that's what we what teach are taxes? In my girl scout troop my girl scout troop my girl scout troop what is self-employment versus having an employer yep come on yeah why did i learn x minus blah blah equals the square root of who gives a fuck yeah i don't know you tell me i haven't applied any of that shit no that makes me so mad makes me so mad too that kathy and i created a girl scout badge that is exactly what you're talking about why to invest how to invest what is a how do you pay your taxes we just had a girl scout meeting last sunday where we taught the girls how to um fill out no how to read a pay stub they were completely lost. They had no idea all these deductions that come out of a pay stub. And then we taught them the difference between a W-2 or W-4, whatever W-2 it is. W-2 and 1099. And a 1099 mm-hmm. and what that means with what your responsibility is. And you could see their brains exploding. Like they were like, what? Oh, what? And I was like, are any of you learning this in high school? No. No. None of them. It's egregious. Why? Anyway, we, we digress. So anyway, you're you're listening to the podcast yes. with Amy and Oksana, and you learned all this the psychiatrist versus psychologist. Uh-huh. Therapist versus psychiatrist. And and Amy said that a lot of her patients describe depression as like the lead blanket that you wear when you go to the dentist when they take your x-rays. Uh-huh. And I was like, holy shit. And then like not being able to get out of bed or take a shower when you want to or need to. And um, not being able to properly groom yourself, just something is going on where that happens to you, and you don't even realize that you're. It's happening, right? It's not really a self-aware. It's not a choice. It's like that's just what's happening. And all of a sudden, one day you look in the mirror and you go, "God damn, my beard is long." Yeah. And wow, my hair is is long yeah. or something like that. I haven't showered in four days, six days. Yeah. And that's extreme, extreme like depression when it's like a week or something like that. Um, so after that episode, I went and started my mental health journey and started reaching out and started figuring out how to do it. And uh, that's I, incredible. Yeah, I had I had Kaiser Permanente. And so I went through the app and there's different options for like healthcare, And then like there's like a mental health section. And so I go, OK, I'll I'll go on that. And. Um, and so they set me up with a psychiatrist after um, I tried a therapist outside of Kaiser Permanente. And I talked to her and she was like 70 and couldn't remember my name or what I did for a living. Maybe not the best. Every single time I went in there, which was like three or four times, she goes, so what do you do? (sighs) Or what do you, how, what, how many do you, do you have any siblings? And I started going, oh yeah, we talked about this last time, but I have. Yeah. (laughs) And so that was kind of like. It was annoying, but like it's a false start. False start. False yeah. start. False flag. That's all. Um, and then, but she's the one also that was like, "Oh, you need to go to a psychiatrist uh-huh. to talk about your." Because I was like, "I might need medication." Yeah. And she was like, "Oh, I don't do that." I'm yeah, like, yeah. "What?" Oh, I get it now. And so, I finally went to the right thing, mm-hmm. and so. I went to a, I kind of want to do like a step-by-step thing for people listening in case they don't know where to start or like how to do this because I didn't. Right. And I'm lucky that I had kind of a mainstream healthcare thing Mm -hmm. that has an app and it's very um, easy to read and easy to kind of navigate. That's great. Um, And so I went to a building that they scheduled me for and they set me up with a 
video call to a psychiatrist in my own private room that they have instead of having psychiatrists there they have like every room has a different computer and so that's how they do psychiatrist appointments and so i started going through like what i would started talking about what i would talk about in therapy Mm -hmm. like growing up and like this and that and traumas and parents and blah 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 yeah and uh basically he was like oh i don't like need all that i just need like symptoms right and that's when it really clicked for me i'm like oh you're like a medicine doctor and you just need symptoms yeah you don't need an explanation as to why you're having those symptoms right and so um what happened was i got put on because i was experiencing really strong anxiety at that Mm. time too um it had started to really ramp up when i turned like 24 i moved back to la after failing the first time and um moving back that second time when I was 24, I was having extreme anxiety, like throwing up anxiety. Oh no. And I didn't know that's what it was. I didn't know what a panic attack was. Right. And, um, it's only happened about like three or four times in my life, Mm -hmm. but those are circumstantial for the most part. And you mean your panic was triggered by circumstance? It wasn't the, the a chemical anxiety. panic attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. those anxiety attacks. But I was also having like kind of like general anxiety. Like yeah, an generalized anxiety is different than way different. a panic attack, which is usually triggered by a circumstance. But I didn't but know that always. I had any of it. Yeah. I didn't know. You didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was. Yeah. I knew that that's not right. And I shouldn't have a stomach ache or be throwing up where I would like it would be like a span of like two, three days right. of like total nauseousness, throwing up not eating can't I, it, it, that's like not good yeah, to go no. through no, at all yeah. uh-huh. and then i would throw up so much that i would start throwing up blood because i'm bursting blood vessels in my oh, throat and stuff. It, it's insane insane and um i experienced that when i first moved and then like something else happened with um some family that um triggered it again and um i was in a better spot like i had started working for you guys already okay and so that's the last time that i had a crazy anxiety attack panic attack moment because i was able to get help after that right so you saw the podcast with amy and then you went to kaiser mm -hmm. and saw the psychiatrist and so i just wanted to give a little bit of anxiety background because um for because of that, they I started a Zoloft, mm-hmm. like a light dose of Zoloft, and they said that you can do this Zoloft thing for like a year and then get off of it, and then you won't have anxiety. That happens for some people. It like cures it, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. It recalibrates you. It, exactly. Yeah. It resets your chemicals or That's different cool. connectors that happen in the brain, yeah. um, and that happen for me that's amazing super super lucky because i didn't want to be on well no nobody wants medications to be on any or medication. like anything like that but you know what if you need it that's what frustrates yep. me so much about mental health who gives a fuck yeah i just didn't want it to hurt my body like totally. medications are 100%. not good for your body per well, se nobody i don't even take advil unless i have to Same. but if you have to then you freaking do it there's no shame i in had it. to yeah exactly as Cotty had a baby yeah. she had to go on it I mean, yeah. we talked about it in a podcast. My mm-hmm. sister-in-law had her baby and was like, the, I am not right. And mm-hmm. when you have a baby, you can't be not right. Mm-hmm. You have to be somewhat regulated. Yeah. So, no, there's no shame ever. I don't want anybody to ever no. think. And I don't think you're saying that. There's no shame in ever seeking medical attention or getting no. medical help yeah. for whatever state of mental health you're in. And it's very strong to do that, actually. Yeah. And like the and once I heard again that you asked five people and they said, I don't want to talk about mental health. Like, yeah, ever since then, like ever since I've gone on my little journey, I've been so open about mental health with everybody in my life and on podcasts and in general and stuff like that. And uh, those are my favorite messages to get are from 
people who relate or like have gotten help from that but um so i was on i did a depression medication and an anxiety medication at the same time start it, you start on low doses mm-hmm. where you don't notice anything and then you gradually increase and then all of a sudden things start to like feel a little better mm-hmm. i had a fogginess mm-hmm. like you know when you first wake up and your eyes are kind of blurry and there's like kind of like a gray fogginess yeah it's literally a gray cloud over your head mm-hmm. I had that and that's um, something that's not circumstantial and that's something that happens when everything is going well. Mm -hmm. It's part of why I realized something was wrong is because these crazy kind of wildest dreams had come true for me and I was doing something so fun and so cool with podcasts and like in my music world and life and i was still having those symptoms right i thought it was i'm gray cloudy eyed low hard time waking up in the morning i don't want to get out of bed before noon um because i was i had to go deliver pizzas right but when i was still feeling that way when i wanted to get up and go do something i was like okay something something's wrong oh something i, I can't control this right this isn't in my control right and so um, I started a, I believe I started a medication that didn't work. Mm. I think it made my testicles hurt. Oh, which is so strange. No bueno. Yeah, like blue balls. Nah. It feels like that, which was so weird. And I had, I had tried when I was a kid. I had been diagnosed with ADHD for a long time, so I knew I had that. And I tried uh, an ADHD medication that hurt my testicles when I was like 19 or something like that. So I never tried it again. The, is the name of the medication the Vice Grip? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's Freaking... terrible. The press? Yeah. <laughs> what the The actual... bull rider? Right? The um, ouch? The weird, owie? right? <laughs> so two different medications have done that, which huh. can't be good. Uh, no, I would say that's definitely not good. Yeah. I remember moving on being at Domino's, like putting my hands on the table going like, Oh my God, this hurts. I can barely walk. I mean, the new tidy whities I bought were pretty <laughs> tight, but this is ridiculous, right? Tidy whities. <laughs> oh my God. And so, um, I had to readjust medication. Right. And which is so normal, so normal again, didn't know, had totally no idea, totally normal, had and no not idea. Everything works. There's not a one size fits all. Nope. It's going to take a few months. Yes. It's going to, you might need to try different variations yes. of things based on your symptoms. At the time I had that crazy anxiety happening with depression. So I got diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Oh, okay. And, um, like a general anxiety, yeah. which is like a light, which is. And general awesome. anxiety is actually much harder to treat with talk therapy because it is general. Yeah. yeah. That, that's what I was told by a therapist. Yeah. Like if you want an anxiety disorder, that's the one that's kind of harder to address because it's not like I am anxious when I fly cool everywhere else i have claustrophobia yeah but those are very specific yeah when you have generalized anxiety it could be about anything yeah and mine was like it's it wasn't about like little things per se but i would overreact and over feel um anxious to situations that i shouldn't have felt anxious about yeah per se yeah yeah um so that's i knew something that's wrong but um got on the anxiety that started to really go away really fast i would say in in a few months and then i got put on the right depression medication which was a um stimulant which is also an adhd medication there you go so it worked perfectly for my brain that's great and um and it has been a life changer that's game awesome changer. so for four years i haven't struggled with cloudiness i haven't struggled with like four years is long time. getting that's out of great. bed yeah. i haven't struggled with um 
The only time it kind of came back was during the pandemic, but I think everyone was feeling that way. I was going to say, join the club. But I was also medicated, so that helped a lot. I bet, yeah. You know, ADHD is such a complicated uh, condition. I I don't think they even have scratched the surface of what they know about ADHD. Uh, Sometimes it presents itself. I have a friend who has a son who's 18 who has ADHD, and it kept presenting sort of as some form of some autism spectrum. Yes. Yeah. But that's not what he has. He has no. ADHD and it affects his social, it affects some of his social relationships, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have autism. He's not on the autism spectrum, but it, a layman would probably mistake it as that. And yeah. it took him a long time to get him a proper diagnosis and on the right medication mm-hmm. so that he could kind of function um he, he wasn't wasn't making friends and you know sometimes people with autism have a hard time socially they don't mm-hmm. uh, they don't read social cues properly sometimes and it looked very similar you know a lot of what isla's um learning disability she's had, she, we've been really lucky to have some really good uh psychologists and school employees that test her and every time they're like she is not add she is not adhd but I could see where a teacher would think she was. I thought she was. She is not. You know, she is uh, consistently has not tested those things. She has a processing disorder, which I think ADHD may be some of a processing disorder. It's part of it. There's learning disabilities that go along with but it. Hers, hers is not. And I, she thinks she's ADHD. And I'm like, lady, every test you've had has told me you're dyslexic and you have a processing, so, like a processing delay. Yeah. And so. You want the answer faster than your brain can process it. Yeah. So your brain's already moved on. Yes. Which is a very different thing than ADD or ADHD. But it also looks like ADHD. It does. It presents as. When she goes, when when does a hen give birth? Yes. And you're like, what the fuck? But it's not. It's that what you've just, a, a perfect indication of what her condition is, is you ask her a question that she doesn't know the answer to now. But in two hours, she gives you the perfect answer. It's a delay Interesting. Yeah. that looks like a distraction, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So if you don't have the right person evaluating you, it takes so much longer to figure out what the real problem is. You have to have someone who's really good at saying, oh, it looks like autism, but it's actually ADHD. It looks like autism, but it's actually a system delay, a processing delay. Yeah. So, because when we were first testing Isla, and I've told Isla this, I was like, is she autistic? I mean, what is going on? Because I am a layman and I don't know. Mm-hmm. And every person is like, she is not ADHD. She is not ADD and she is not autistic. She has a processing delay and she gets bored waiting for her brain to process. Mm-hmm. So she moves on and then that'll come to her later. Yeah. So uh, later, like ask her the test question now and come back in 20 minutes and get the answer. Yeah. If you ask her now and expect the answer now, it's going to suck. Yeah. But in 20 minutes, she's going to have the best answer ever. Which is awesome. Which is awesome. And it has been when they explain that to me uh, and you can look for that in her in her day to day life, Mm -hmm. then it makes sense. You know, I would she'd get in trouble. And I talked to her about why she's in trouble and her literal answers would make no sense whatsoever. 20 minutes later, I'd go back and readdress it and she's got it. And when they explained that to me, I went, oh, so what I need to do when I'm parenting her is Mm -hmm. say, think about this. I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about it. And then she can process it at her speed because I just had this conversation with someone on our team today who was functioning in their way of functioning and not getting the results they wanted from Bert. And I said, what's important to you? Is it the way you function or is it your effectiveness? Because if it's your effectiveness, you're going to have to address the way you function because it's not effective. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the way you function. It works amazingly for 99% of the people, but you're dealing with someone who is not typical. So if you want to be effective, You can't be typical either. You have to adjust. So in parenting Isla, I had to say that to myself and say, do I want to affect change in her or do I just want to parent the way I think I should? Because parenting the way I think I should is not effective for this kid. 
So yes, from the outside looking in, one would think I'm too easy on her. I give her too much time or whatever. But what I'm doing is very strategic as I'm going, here's the issue. I'll be back. Let's talk about it together. And I'm not going to hold you accountable for something you're not capable of. Why would I hold you accountable for something I know as a parent you're not capable of? That's ridiculous. I should hold you accountable for what you are capable of. And that accountability at the end of the day looks the same as it does for Georgia, who doesn't have this system processing delay. So at the end of the day, I can say to Georgia, you lied to me. You're grounded. Here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here's the solution. Here's the consequence. Done. Mm -hmm. I can't have that same. I can have the same end result with Isla. I can say, this is, you lied to me. I want you to think about that for a minute and I'll be back to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I can leave and go back and go, what do you think about that? You lied to me. Mm. I think the consequence should be this. I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. And I'm going to go away and I come back and go, what do you think about that consequence? Okay, that's what this is going to look like. So it's taken me 45 minutes with her for the same end result as it took me three minutes with Georgia. But what is my goal? My goal is not to berate Isla and make her feel like shit because she can't process something. My goal is to have her feel the consequence of her action. So I can choose to parent exactly the same for these two children who are drastically different, for one who definitely thinks differently. I don't think she thinks subpar to Georgia. She thinks differently. She sees the world in such a complex way. You know, Georgia is very literal. A plus B equals C. For Isla, she's like, can you substitute Y for C and then maybe have it equal L? And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Now I got to deal with Y and L? What about my C? What's happened to my C? Because I'm like Georgia. I'm very linear. So in my in my path and journey of parenting, I had to figure out my goal is the effectiveness. It's not the method. So I can't use the same method with my kids. That's asinine. I have two entirely different children. The effectiveness it was is what matters. Yeah. So if we all could just, I just had this literally this morning with a team member had this conversation. What matters is your effectiveness. And one might think that's unfair. One might think that I'm codependent in those thoughts or that I'm allowing Isla to be the same. But berating someone into a different behavior never sticks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to bring them to that so they can learn it on their own. And if I show her how to step-by-step process something, hopefully that processing time shrinks. But me demanding that she be exactly like Georgia or a process the way I think she should is futile. It doesn't get me. It's not effective. She's so lucky that she has you as a parent. I mean, you have two things that you are doing there, patience and flexibility. And that is huge. She's so lucky that she has you as a mom and, you know, we're all lucky that we get to listen to you talk like that Aww. and talk about what you're going through and cuz your solutions are working and some people are lost they don't have solutions that mm. are working for them and so it's so cool that we get to listen Aww. and um I'm so lucky to be a part of this podcast and be producing it and it's so cool that we've done 5 years in a row and um well let me toot your horn before we leave right we're lucky to have you You have a great attitude. You are always happy. You are always in a good mood. Our schedule is stupid. It's never the same. It's completely inconsistent. Bert is so difficult sometimes, not because he's a difficult person, but because his schedule is bananas. To get just simple ad reads done is so hard. And there's nothing better than having a teammate who has the right attitude. You have the best attitude. You approach this with with so much give. You know, there's a lot of give in being able to be that flexible and that roll with it. You know, it doesn't work today. No problem. You have very, I don't even know if you've ever, but I don't want to say ever because it's so absolute, but you've so seldomly ever given pushback in getting this shit done. And that makes it possible. Yeah. Because if you said to me, I have to do this, from 10 to 2 every Tuesday, I'd never work. 
my, I, I work on my friend's schedule because I'm asking them to do something mm -hmm. for free. Yeah. So I can't be like, mm, I can only have you between 10 and 2 on Tuesday. That would never work. And yeah. that is because of you, partly because you're so flexible and willing to show up and do whatever needs to be done and have a great attitude about it. So well, thank, thank you. you. And I love hearing you. I know you used to be in the room with us, but I still hear you chuckle next yeah. door. <laughs> I still hear it. And I love that. And I love that you give me feedback because like this past episode, I was very concerned that it wasn't going to come off well, but you are so supportive. And that makes me keep coming back mm. that I have someone who's impartial, who's listening, who goes, no, 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 you were fine. Yeah. And I go, oh, thank God. Okay. So thank you You're for welcome. your yeah. five years of commitment and, um, and commitment. I mean, it's a commitment. Yeah, I got I got patience and flexibility too. That you That's do. Something that, that I that you do. I've kind of always had that, and I, I I like to work that way. Anyways, I don't like it. I'm don't. I'm not a nine to five person. No. This yeah. is why this works for I'm me. I'm not either. This is why I wanted to be a producer because um I don't I don't I'm not a I'm not a nine to five person. No. I couldn't go to an office five days a week and work nine to five and then go home i can't have the same schedule every week right that drives me nuts right that's not good for my mental health right and um i need to be able to jump from thing to thing to thing yeah so if this doesn't work okay no problem i'm gonna go do, do this over here like, right i love working like that yeah and um and i'm i've i've always kind of to wrap up the mental health side, I've always been a happy person. Yeah, I really love life, mm -hmm. and even though I have depression or struggle with that, I've I've never been like suicidal in any way no, because yeah. I love life so much, and I I know how much I can get out of life, and I know what a great life that I have had for my whole entire life, and um, and because of you guys and this podcast, I was able to identify a problem and get help for it oh that's amazing and i wouldn't have been able to uh, afford everything if it wasn't for you guys i wouldn't have been able to have pinpointed everything if it wasn't for you guys and like it's invaluable to me and um I've, I've been dedicated to you guys and your podcasts um for a little over five years now with with Burt's, and um because i love you guys so much and you have allow me to grow as a producer like we we all started from the bottom of podcasts and yeah. like worked our way up like i wasn't a professional video editor when i started but luckily i didn't need to be because no. we set up one camera in the corner right and then we grew from we grew, there yeah and and now with this new studio that we're building yeah it is involved and i would not have been able to do any of that that new stuff without your guys' patience with me, I guess, or growing with me um, and allowing me to um, learn. And I have been nonstop learning from the day I started because I didn't want to mess this up in any way. Right. And I have been committed to that. And I've learned so many valuable, amazing skills. I've met so many amazing people. I could be emotional. You can be emotional. I could be emotional thinking about it. And it's just, I it chills like for real, because I have such a good relationship now and I've just grown so much. And, but the biggest thing is like my mental health thing, just getting help for all of that. And looking back and realizing that it's been four years since I've struggled with that at all that's great i don't struggle to get out of bed anymore it's amazing at all um, that's freedom it's absolute freedom yeah and i love you so much and happy five I years know, i love you too halston yeah. happy five years yay <laughs> yay five years yay. okay here's the five more here's the five more here's the five more <laughs> <Ding>. <laughs>